Kadisha! <laughs> I didn't know I was mutilated as a baby until I was 15. My clitoris was cut off when I was a week old, and this is something that happens to nearly all the girls in the Gambia. It's called female genital mutilation. When I was 15, I was brought to America to marry an older man. When he tried to have sex with me, that's when I realized what female genital mutilation was, and that's when my horror started. When Khadija was born, I knew that I could never let this happen to her. I knew that I had to do something to stop it. Most of the girls and women you see on the streets have been cut. Their clitoris was cut off or worse. This has been going on for thousands of years. I've come home to try and do something to end it. Even if that means taking on my family, my tribe, and the whole of Gambia. Uh, hi, everyone. Um, my name is Jaha Dukere, and um, in 2013, out of my Atlanta home, I started um, a support group for women in my community who had experienced female genital mutilation, known as FGM, as well as young women who were forced to get married. At the time, I didn't know what I was doing, and my family thought I was crazy. My husband didn't understand how I turned our house into a shelter for women and complained about it almost every day. Fast forward to 2014, I realized the number of women that were impacted by this issue in America and how no one was talking about it. I decided to start a change.org petition to ask President Obama to look into this issue and do something about it. When I started the change.org petition, again, everyone in my family, including my friends, thought I was crazy for doing that. But in two weeks after starting my petition, some of the biggest celebrity stars in this country started tweeting out my petition. The New York Times started covering my story. The Guardian started covering my story. CNN started covering my story. By the time we knew it, more than 220,000 people in America had signed my petition. And President Obama ordered the CDC to conduct a study to find out the number of women impacted by this issue. And the CDC conducted the study and found that more than half a million women in this country are living with the practice of FGM. We pushed for a law that made it illegal to transport girls out of the US for the purpose of FGM. And President Obama signed that into law. And with the success of... <laughs> so with the success of what we were able to accomplish in the US, I decided to go back to my home country in October of 2014. I was able to launch the first youth-led movement against FGM in the Gambia. Exactly one year, one month after I launched my campaign, the Gambia banned FGM. Three months later, child marriage was banned in the Gambia as well. I 
I think one of the reasons why I started doing this work was because of my daughter. But globally, every single day, 6,000 girls are cut. 200 million women are living as a consequence of FGM. But this is not an issue that people want to hear about. This is not an issue that's widely talked about, especially in Western countries. And there's a lot of feminist movements, but when you talk about FGM, it's not something that they really associate with because of just the nature of the practice itself. To me, it was important, and I knew that the only way I could ever get the world to listen was to put a human face to this issue and was to put a human voice to this issue. And as a result, I opened myself up. I allowed cameras to follow me for three years. It was one of the most uncomfortable things that I would ever do in my life. It was hard for my family. It was hard on my children. It was hard on everyone around me because I felt naked and exposed. But I think it was also one of the best things that I did because people from my background don't make it as far as I do. I mean, I come from a very privileged family in Africa. I never lacked anything. My father is a diamond miner and provided a lot of things for me growing up. But again, I come from a culture where the only thing we are ever good for as women is being servants to a man. You're your father's daughter until you're at the age of 14, 15, where you become your husband's wife. And then after that, you become the burden of your sons. And as women, we are taught that that's all what we can do. We can never be more than that. So for me, I ended up being that example in my community that young women can look up to. If I had failed at this work, it would show them an example of what not to be. But now I'm that daughter that's celebrated throughout my country, not only in my country, but throughout Africa. I'm that person that young women want to be. And that's the reason why I continue doing this work. My organization is about to launch the biggest campaign in Africa that targets all the African nations to ban FGM by 2020. And we know that we can do it. Because before now, a lot of the conversation regarding this issue has been driven by mostly the West. And it was viewed as them against us. They don't appreciate our culture. They don't appreciate who we are. And this is our identity. And I think for the first time, we've managed to shift that. Because it's no longer people from the West talking about how bad FGM is, but it's actually women who are impacted by this issue that talk about their pain, and there's no way you can deny that pain. There's no way you can ignore our experiences. And I believe we are the people that can change the minds of our fathers. We are the people that can change the minds of our community leaders, and we are the people that can drive that change in our communities. I think one of the biggest issues with development in Africa is people import solutions into our community, and they never see us as actually the change agents that can drive that change. I mean, I remember going to a development summit that was organized by President Obama when he was in office. I was one of the only women in the room and definitely the only black person in that room. And the issues that they were talking about was FGM, child marriage, poverty, hunger. And there was no one in that room that can relate to those experiences that are from that community. And I think if we're really, really serious about change and a lot of how we do it, we need to start supporting people that are on the ground doing this work. I mean, when I think about the work that I do, a lot of times when people ask me, how big is your organization? I remember until this year, we were not a big organization that had a lot of money. Most of the work that we did was self-funded by myself. I was a banker before I founded my organization. I worked for Wells Fargo for five years. Right out of college, I became a teller for Wells Fargo. From that, I grew to the point of commercial banker by the time I quit my job. And I remember when I decided to go back home and that very night when I decided to chase after our president who was a dictator for 22 years in the Gambia and all he was known for is torturing people, making people disappear and no one was able to confront him regardless of anything. And this is one issue that for 22 years that he had been in power, he had never spoken out about. And I woke up one night and I remember I had a friend of mine that visited from the UK. She's a journalist and an editor with the Guardian newspaper. And I went up to her and I said, Maggie, I need $200. I don't have money, but I need $200 to buy gas. Because tomorrow morning I'm going on tour. And she said, where are you going? I told her, I can't tell you where I'm going, but I need a cameraman with me. I don't want all of you to come with me, but I need one camera person to come with me. And the Guardian gave me a camera person that traveled with me. 
I went after the president in every single village that he went to. He was on tour. And I was detained. I was harassed. I was questioned. They wanted to know why I was following them and why I had a white guy with me. I think that was the most terrifying experience of my life. And I knew that only two things would come out of that trip. I'll either end up dead or I would end up getting what I wanted. And when things got so bad during that trip, I remember calling back home. And I told my best friend, you can't tell my dad, you can't tell my husband, you can't tell anyone where I am, but this is where I am. And if something happens to me, just tell my children that I was very, very stupid for doing this and I'm really, really sorry that I did this to them. And eventually, I think after I went through the most terrifying experience with our version of the CIA, they realized that I didn't care about politics. I didn't care about any of the things that the president was doing. All I cared about was one issue, which was female genital mutilation and how we can end it in Africa. And they shared that with the president. And he called me in for a meeting. And the first thing that he asked me, why are you so obsessed with this issue? And I remember telling him, it's not about anyone. This is about me and what I've been through and what I continue to live through. And knowing that in our country alone, 74% of girls are subjected to this practice. And you being a father of a daughter and being the leader of our country, having a moral obligation to do something about this issue. And for 22 years, you stayed quiet about it. And he held my hand and told me that he totally agreed with me. Two days later, he came out publicly and banned the practice. And our parliament legislated a law that made it criminal. There's not much that's unique about me, and I'm not different from any one of you that's in this room. Our voice is very, very powerful. And advocacy is the only thing that you can do for nothing. It doesn't cost anything to speak up. I think a lot of times when we give money to big international NGOs that are sitting in London or sitting in New York that are claiming to be saving children in Africa, what we fail to realize is rarely does any of that money go on the ground to the people that actually matter. Africa rarely sees that money and we need to think about how we approach these things. The work that we do in the Gambia, we're not a big international NGO, we don't have a lot of money. But one thing that we know is with or without funds, we would always wake up to do this work. Because for us, it's not about running a nonprofit organization, but it's about our lives, it's about our daughters, it is about our children and their future. And for us, we don't have a choice but to make sure that these practices end. And we know that we can do it. Sometimes for me personally, I think it's very hard to look for support because of my personal connection to some of these issues that I'm working on. And I think that's one of the reasons why our organization hasn't grown to the capacity that uh, will enable us to expand our work and our programs to different regions of Africa. But what I'm going to urge a lot of you, because I know that when Anand reached out to me, one of the things that he told me was, Sarasota is um, a place that has a lot of humanitarians and people that really, really care about global issues. So I would urge to make the case to each one of you that has the power and the influence to support causes like that. Because FGM is ending. It has been around for thousands of years. But for the first time in our history, we know that this practice is ending. I see it every single day. I moved back to the Gambia in June of this year. I took my children, packed up. I went home for two weeks because I wanted the children to get the experience of being in Africa and meet my father and my family. So I decided to go back for two weeks and did some work when I was there. Two weeks turned into a month. The month turned into two months. And I've been living in the Gambia ever since June. And I think I'm home finally because for the first time being there, I actually see the change that's happening. And those interactions with those communities and seeing those girls who lives are impacted by our work has inspired me to be there because I don't want to miss that history. And for me, seeing that every single day, people are changing their minds, not because we have a law telling them that this is criminal, because, but finally, people are making that conscious decision that this age-old tradition is something that we need to leave behind. Let's look at America, for instance. I'm as much American as I am Gambian. I moved to this country when I was 15. 
Because of this country, I have an education. Because of this country, I found my identity and I found my voice. And that would always be part of me. But slavery used to be a tradition in this country. I mean, we are seeing slavery again in recent times, but at least in this country, we can say that we ended slavery. And when we look at places like China, where foot binding used to be a thing, but when they decided that they wanted to end foot binding, it took them 10 years for them to end practices like that. And this practice is not about them. It's not about us deciding that this is a culture that we should respect. If anywhere in the world parents were cutting off body parts of their daughters, their hands, their ears, we would have an outcry. And as a community, we would say that that's wrong. And this is about right and wrong. And we know that FGM is wrong. It has no benefit whatsoever to the girl. It's solely for the benefit of men. And for us as a society, as a human race, should be able to make that stand and say that enough is enough. We need to abandon FGM once and for all. So today, I want to leave all of you with that action to make a commitment. If you have the resources to support efforts led by grassroots communities, support them. If you have a huge following on social media, or even if you know someone, the more we continue to raise awareness and the more people know about this, the more we get results. The only reason why I'm standing in front of you is because people started following my work. It's because of the awareness that was raised. Through one petition, my work was able to reach President Obama. That led to me being named one of Time Magazine's 100 Most Influential People. That led to our ability to change laws in Africa. That led to people taking us more seriously. Imagine if we had more of a support from people like you. To actually, we did this work with barely no money at all. But if we had the resources to organize public-facing campaigns, and actually reach mass populations throughout Africa. I personally don't think it's going to take us 10 years for us to get the results that we want. So I just want to tell you all, thank you for taking the time to listen to me. And um, if you want to learn more about our work, you can go to endviolenceagainstgirls.com. Um, it's a place where you can learn more about Safe Hands for Girls. You can learn more about the work that we are doing on the ground in Africa, as well as in Atlanta. We have an office in Atlanta. Some of the services that we provide in Atlanta is for refugee girls who were subjected to FGM before they moved to the United States. We form a support group for them because a lot of these girls find themselves in American schools, but a lot of their peers in the school don't understand a lot of the things that they are going through at home. So a lot of their challenges, even with academics, is something that people just don't understand and they don't fit into the average after school program. So our team has formed something for those girls with those specific needs, where they can come and have conversations in a non-judgmental setting, where they're allowed to be themselves with people who understand their journey, where they're from and where they're trying to go. And we also serve as role models, because a lot of times you don't see women from our community that are successful like we are, that are not dependent on men. So for them to be able to look up to us and see most of what we are doing and knowing that we are from that culture, from that religion, and we still have that identity, but we are doing amazing work is something that we believe is inspirational. And those girls have gone on to be mentors for younger girls. So the work is not only about Africa, but it's something that's happening in the United States and it's something that's affecting women here. So I just want to say thank you to everyone and thank you to Pink and Anan um, for having me come here and share my story and share my work with you. And I hope most of you would um, <clears throat> find it to learn more about FGM and be part of the change that's happening. So thank you.